Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. I'm Callie Austin with the Nebraska Tourism Commission. With me I have Jamie and Rush here. He's the lead producer at Molly Marketing. And he's going to walk us through how to create videos on a shoestring budget. If you have any questions during today's webinar, you can email me at callie.austed at nebraska.gov. <laughs> had to check that there. Um, but yeah, let's welcome Jamie in up here and we'll get started. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Callie. Hello, everyone out there that's joining us for this webinar. We've got a few people here in the conference space. But yes, what I'm going to be talking about today is producing video on a shoestring budget. Uh, who am I? Like Callie said, I'm Jamie and Rush, uh, lead video producer at Molly Marketing. We are a full service marketing and advertising agency based here in Lincoln, Nebraska. We work with a number of different uh, tourism clients across the state. That's one of the main industries that we focus on. Uh, so what does video production look like for us? Well, for us, it's a lot of times quite a bit of a camera equipment, mics, um, lights as well. Um, also do some travel. So in travel situations, a little bit trimmed down set up there. Uh, but also in my spare time, I like to shoot some uh, short films. So those are even bigger productions, um, several people helping out there. Um, this is one we shot out in uh, Colorado actually uh, last year. But we've also done short films at much smaller budgets. So you might think, oh, that any, to do anything like that, it's thousands of dollars. Well, it can be thousands of dollars, or it can be as simple. Uh, we shot this one-minute horror sh uh, thriller short f film for $37. So it doesn't have to be a large investment in order to produce quality video content. So what am I going to talk about today? Well, I'm going to go through the phases of uh, video production. Every video production project that we take on goes through these four phases, pre-production, shoot production, post-production, and then distribution. Now we're talking about pre-production. This is what takes place before we ever pick up the camera, before we ever have talent on screen. We want to plan out and be as thorough as possible before all that. Uh, first, one of the key things with every video project that we take on, we want to determine the video type. And I'm just going to click through here. Uh, there's a number of different video types, whether it's a product or service, promotional video, if we're doing customer or client testimonials, uh, maybe referral sources. You can do something like a location tour, an announcement video, training videos are great resources to have, and then also examples like this, live streams or webinars. Uh, and then there's also event videos. So first thing we do is uh, talk to the client, figure out, or if it's internal, we t meet with our team and figure out what type of video it is. And then we're going to think about the video style. Um, are we looking at a scripted video um, where we're writing out specific lines of dialogue? Uh, oops, sorry about that. Get that back up. Or are we working with more of a um, narrative where we've got an interview or a voiceover or montage? We want to figure out what style we're working with because that's going to influence one, kind of the length of the video, um, the different assets that we're going to need, what we're going to need to do on production, all those extra elements. Uh, some other common ones are montage style videos, so whether that's just video clips or photos with some music over top or if it's a combination of all of those. A lot of times we're using documentary style interviews, but we'll also mix in a narrative voiceover that serves as our narrator and helps tie those uh, segments together. When we're thinking of distribution channels, uh, we want to get as much um, usage out of the content that we can. And this isn't necessarily just taking the same video and putting it in all of these different distribution channels. Oftentimes, it's creating different versions of the video. So if we have a video uh, dedicated for a client's website, we know we've got more of an active uh, viewer, and it can be a little bit on the longer side. And by longer side, we're still talking only about 90 seconds to two minutes. But uh, social media, we want to create a shorter version of that because we know people's attention spans usually on social media, if we're catching them in a news feed, is going to be shorter. And so we want to have a different version. We also want to make sure if we're going social media that it's optimized uh, with subtitles or on-screen text graphics. So that way the viewer is going to be able to get the message without clicking to play sound because a lot of people are watching these videos without sound. Uh, we might have a version for email, uh, we might do a live premiere, or we might repurpose and use it as in, in a location as an office display. 
So what are the pre-production documents that we work with? Uh, typically, at least, it's an outline. Uh, a lot of times for us, that's kind of our proposal. Our video proposal is basically our outline. Uh, if it's kind of a more in-depth project, we'll go into a storyboard, and a storyboard helps us visualize and plan out the production. Uh, this video outline, we want to establish a primary goal. Every video that we do, we want to have a goal tied with it. So uh, that's not a goal of, hey, I want to get a thousand views, because that's a vanity metric. That isn't as important. What we want is we want people to take an action. So whether it's we want them to visit a landing page specifically, we want them to submit a form, we want them to buy this product, we tie that to actionable goals. We also want to identify our target audience. Uh, this, may, this changes with every video. If we're creating a video that we want a mass appeal, we want everyone to watch it, we're not being very successful because not every video is going to appeal to everyone. We want to specify exactly who it is. And if it's 19 to 34 year olds, that's going to be vastly different uh, than a video targeted for 55 to 75 plus uh, age range. We also want to establish what our structure and style is for the video. We want to specify any equipment that we're going to need, and then we're going to um, outline the shooting dates and locations that we're going to need in order to uh, make this project feasible. Uh, when we're looking at a video storyboard, what's that look like? Well, there's an example on the side there. We, uh, we like to have a scene number, so that way we can stay as organized as possible. That can just be as simple as one, two, three, four. Um, we also want to figure out the timing, especially when we're on scripted videos, whether we're doing videos for TV broadcast or even for social media, we want to keep them fairly concise and short. With TV, we've got hard stops of either 15, 30, or 60 seconds. But even if we're doing one for social media, it can be real easy to think you're going to do a 30-second video and then it's jumping up to a minute if you don't uh, envision and kind of time that out. We're also going to have a reference image in there. Um, quick thing, I just do a Google search to find an image there that matches the style so that way whoever is going to be shooting the video knows kind of what, uh, what we have in mind from our creative department or whoever's envisioning the video. Uh, we're going to talk through or write down the shot type, you know, are we, are we going to have a wide camera angle, are we going to have a close up, what is that, and then also specifically the equipment that we're going to need on location when we get to that specific shot. And then we'll also include a scene description in there so we understand what's taking place during that scene. And then if applicable, if there's a narrative script, whether that's the people on camera talking or a voiceover, we'll have that included in the document. Uh, one of the key things in the pre-production process is location scouting. Um, you want to check out the location beforehand. Every project that we do, we try to physically be there in person to understand, you know, hey, is this location right next to a highway? And we were planning to do an outdoor interview shot, and that's not going to work because there's going to be cars, trucks, all that loud noise, noise there. Uh, we also want to make sure we're at the same type, time of day that we plan to film. So we might come there and like see it in the middle of the day, hey, the lighting's great here, but we plan to shoot 6, 7 o'clock in the evening, and that sun just went behind that building. We didn't even think of that, and now we have no light source. And so you want to make sure you're there at the same time of day that you're going to be filming. And that helps you plan out your video shoot. So oftentimes what I do is I just carry my smartphone with me. I pull that out and I'll take reference photos or even videos beforehand so we get an idea of, hey, what's this going to actually look like in camera? Because how we see things is completely different than what you see in that 16 by 9 and that square aspect ratio. And so I'll oftentimes take reference photos and videos uh, during that. Uh, another thing is if you can't be there in location, you can hop onto tools such as Google Maps. You can uh, online search it, or if it's someone you're working with, I oftentimes ask a client, hey, take some reference photos for me if we can't make it there. Take some videos, do a live uh, video call with them so you're able to understand what the location is. But at the end of the day, it's great storytelling is key. Your videos should be entertaining, informative, or engaging in order to get people to actually watch it. Um, when we go, next kind of phase that we're going to go to is the shoot production. And when we talk about shoot production, that's the actual capturing of the assets. So that's recording the video, recording the audio, um, whatever that might be. Uh, important step for this is obviously equipment. We're going to need some type of uh, camera to record video. We're going to need some type of light source, whether that's a light that we bring in, whether that's room lights, or whether that's simply the sun. Uh, we're going to need some type of light because without light, the camera can't really do anything. 
We're gonna need a microphone. Most cameras have built-in microphones. A lot of times they're not very good. So we always recommend having an external microphone of some sort. And then we're gonna need some type of stabilization for that camera, whether that's a tripod, whether that's holding it handheld, um, or whether that's a gimbal or something a little bit more modern like that. When we talk about camera, pretty much everyone I would think everyone even listening on this webinar most likely has a smartphone. Smartphones are getting amazing cameras in them. The newest iPhones, the newest Android phones coming out, they've got multiple lenses on there. So you don't even have to change the lens. You've got capabilities of doing that in camera. You can do that automatically. They're putting really, really good cameras in there. So there's really no excuse. I mean, if you're walking around with a camera, you can oftentimes say, oh, I can't do video production because we don't have the equipment. Well, if you've got that nice of a camera in your pocket, that really doesn't work as an excuse. But then there's other things. There's uh, webcams. Uh, this computer's got a webcam right here. Pretty much every laptop now has a good webcam in it that you can use. Uh, there's hybrid cameras, uh, photo cameras. Most all modern photo cameras take some form of video. A lot of them take really good video. Uh, you've got dedicated camcorders. You've got action cameras, GoPros, the Osmo action. Uh, then you also have got aerial drones. So there's just a plethora of different tools out there that can help you capture high quality video at a very reasonable cost. We're, we're really spoiled right now. I mean, 10, 15 years ago, you were not able to get this type of video quality at these, it took thousands and thousands of dollars. So uh, an iPhone, I've got that listed there because the, I'm gonna show about five to seven different videos in this presentation. Uh, all the videos that we shot ourselves, we actually shot it on an iPhone. So we want to show you what it's actually capable of because it's easy for us to say, hey, yeah, go shoot out on an iPhone, but I don't really have any examples. We took the uh, honest approach. I mean, we have much more expensive equipment, but we said, you know, if we're going to preach it, let's actually do it. And so all the videos that we produced were shot on an iPhone and then edited on an iPad, actually. So when we talk lighting, um, the easiest and the most abundant light source out there, uh, especially if you're outdoors, is the sun. Um, so we recommend using the sun. You don't have to pay for that. Um, that's a great light source. Uh, it's, it's a light source that you kind of need to modify, whether that's not going in direct lighting from the sun or using a diffuser. And I've got a video that will explain that. But inside, uh, a great option is continuing to use that sun through a window um, and getting some of that light that bounces in there. Um, or just using the available lights within um, a, a room, so whatever that's overhead lights, whether that's lamps, whatever you can find there. Um, that's kind of lighting that on a shoestring budget, you're not going to have the budget to buy your own light, so we're going to use what's available there. So here's a video that we put together that's going to walk you through some different scenarios. This again was one that we shot on an iPhone and edited on, on an iPad. All right, so the first thing for this video is we need to choose a location for filming. And we really like this conference room that lets in a lot of light. So we're going to use that to our advantage by placing our subject and the camera right next to that window. In this first scenario, we really haven't done much. We're just setting up the camera, and we've got our lights on and window shade down. And you can see this is our least favorite because uh, we don't get much separation from the background and it's not very flattering for our talent. So we're going to fix that by raising the curtains here and letting in a lot of that natural light. You know, realize quickly that that uh, might be a little bit too ex overexposed and so we're going to mainly reduce the exposure on the iPhone here and bring that down a little bit. And now you can see what our subject looks like there. There's some great separation with the background. I uh, really like that, but it might be a little bit too dramatic for the look we're thinking. So we're going to bring those shades back down, but we're also going to flip off those lights. And here's our third scenario, which we like the best, which is our lights off and our window shade down. And this is a nice flattering look uh, with a little bit of separation from the background. Uh, before we finish up, we're going to lock our exposure and our focus by holding that so that way it won't jump focus or change our exposure. But here's one last look at our first setup with the lights on and the window shade down. Then we brought that window shade up, let it let in that light, and here's our option number two. And then finally, our third interior option that we like the best was our lights off and our window shade down. In this first setup, we've got the sun behind the camera, and this is our least favorite option because we're getting a lot of harsh direct lighting on our subject. It's not very flattering, and so we're going to flip the camera and the subject around, and now that sun is behind our subject acting as a nice edge light, as well as cutting down on the harshness on the light on the face. 
But our third and best option is actually to move our subject into the shade where we get nice natural light on the face and it's much more flattering and appealing. So yeah, moving on from lighting to microphone, as I mentioned earlier, pretty much every camera comes with a microphone. But the problem is that's usually going to be far away from your subject or uh, an omnidirectional microphone that's going to pick up a lot of background noise. So one of the biggest tools or the most used tools that we have is a shotgun mic and these come in a couple different flavors. But the example there I've got is one that can plug directly into a smartphone and can focus the microphone path of what you're going to be picking up. Another option, a good option, is a lav mic because that's a microphone that's going to be attached to the person, the talent speaking on camera, and that's going to get that microphone as close as possible to the audio source in order to cut down on that background um, audio. And so we've created another video here that's going to show you those two options when we're using them with a smartphone in a couple different scenarios into your... So this audio is coming from the internal microphone inside my phone, and you could be hearing some echo and possibly the fan in the AC. To fix this, we're going to turn off that fan and we're going to raise up our temperature on our air conditioning unit. So we turned off the fan and we turned off the AC, so the audio might be a little bit better, but you're probably still going to get some echo. In order to improve that audio even more, we're going to add a shotgun mic to the camera to provide a little bit better audio, but we can also monitor the audio with headphones for our camera operator. So now we're recording our audio with a shotgun mic connected directly to our camera. A great feature about this is you can have someone monitoring the audio on the side. And our best option is actually going to be adding a wired lav microphone. This is a small microphone that's going to be connected directly to our talent and then plugged in through a wire into our camera. So in this setup, the audio is coming from our lavalier microphone, which is connected directly into my phone. And you're going to get a lot more clear, less reverb audio because the microphone is right here on my shirt rather than inside my phone. Next couple options will be exterior. In this setup, our audio is coming from the internal microphone inside of our camera. And so you might be hearing some wind, possibly even some giggles or even some insects. In this setting, we're using our wired lavalier mic, and you'll notice that the audio is great, it's clear, but because it's wired, it is a bit inconvenient. So this is where your shotgun mic is going to be a lot more handy. So right now we're using a shotgun mic with a windscreen over it. And this microphone really excels in outdoor settings like this because that windscreen is going to really cut down that background noise, so you're going to get better audio overall. Alright, next topic we're going to talk about is stabilization. Um, this could be as simple as setting the camera up on a tripod. Um, some type of, some form of getting that stable. Uh, the tripod actually is probably one of our most used tools uh, in our professional video arsenal. A lot of people think, oh, gimbals are the new exciting thing. Well, we highly recommend in investing into a good tripod. Uh, the versatility that allows you of getting a stable shot at different heights that you want at different angles is very helpful. Uh, we use a little bit more expensive tripods that allow us to pan and tilt, but even simple $40, $50 tripods here uh, with a smartphone mount can be adequate enough. Uh, there's also tabletop tripods, so if you're in an office environment and you don't necessarily need or have the room for a large uh, tripod, you can just get a tabletop one. Those also kind of double as little selfie sticks that you can use. And there is also the option of a gimbal. Uh, we're not big fans of gimbals. We have one, we just don't use it a ton because it's just an extra piece of gear. Uh, the nice part about smartphones now, most modern smartphones, is they're putting in really good stabilization built into the camera. So if you're hand holding it, you can oftentimes get a lot of the capabilities of a gimbal and get that smooth footage without necessarily having to add and buy additional equipment. Um, another great way is handheld, like I said, because they have that optical image stabilization within the camera, you can handhold shots and be perfectly fine. So here's a couple examples of camera stabilization options. So right now we're using a tabletop tripod, which is kind of like a selfie stick. And this is great if you're just walking around, you want to make some videos, and you want that modern vlog look. Using a small handheld tabletop tripod or even a selfie stick can help get you that wide look when shooting video from your smartphone. 
So this shot is another example of the classic modern vlog look, but you also don't always need a handheld tripod. So here I'm just using my phone, we're doing a vertical shot, and which would be great for Instagram videos, possibly even Snapchat as well. Using that tabletop tripod, you can also put the camera in unique low-level angles like this one. This can help add visual interest by providing the viewer with a perspective they don't normally see with their eyes at eye level. You also don't need fancy equipment to get nice, smooth, steady shots like this. Just utilizing practice and uh, slow, steady movement and holding the camera tight can help you achieve this look all handheld. But at the end of the day, one of the best tools can simply just be a tripod or light stand that holds your camera steady while you present on screen. So yeah, some shooting tips and advice that we have. Um, key thing is the filming location, the location that you choose to film in. You want to look for good lighting. You might have an idea of, hey, this uh, office would be great, but then when you set up a camera and you realize there's just not enough light here, all my footage is very grainy or noisy. Uh, you also want to listen for background noise. That's kind of a key thing that we uh, oftentimes struggle with uh, when we get on location and a client's got a, a spot figured out, but they didn't realize there's an office right next door, or there's a bathroom right next door that an uh, air dryer is going, or the AC uh, heating and HVAC unit in that room can't be controlled. So those two things are kind of key that we, we recommend when thinking about a location, but also clean up your background. Um, you might not realize it, but especially if you're filming in an office, or something similar to that. You might have some cluttered location behind you or some papers. Just take the time to clean it up and make sure the background looks presentable. So here's, uh, this is Peter McKinnon. Uh, he provides a great reference as far as filming location. Uh, he's a very good YouTube um, photographer and videographer that we get a lot of useful static content shot, from. Static shot. Okay, point number five and the last point for this video is the location and time of day. Now obviously with locations, if you have an incredible landscape in front of you, you're standing at the outlook over the Golden Gate Bridge, if you are in the mountains, if you're canoeing through Lake Louise, if you are at the tip of a volcano or deep in the jungle, yes, that footage is going to look good inherently because where you are is just insane. It's a magical landscape, it looks incredible. However, these rules still apply to even if you're just shooting in your own office. Now the angle of those shots in those locations is important as well. If you're in a nice jungle, and you're shooting way too low but you're missing all the nice trees above, that's stuff you got to think about. If you're in your office filming a talking head sequence like what I'm doing right now, if I was on a low angle, this just doesn't look as good. It's just fact. There's way too much space above. There's nothing interesting enough above to justify why my camera is at such a stupid angle. If the angle was too high, you would all instantly be like, okay, pause one second. Why is that camera so freaking high? All of these little adjustments make a big deal. Another quick tip that I've seen a lot of people do that drives me nuts is clean up the background. Take the stuff off your desk. If you've got boxes in the corner, move them out of the way for the shot. Move them behind the camera. So many people just leave sh and garbage hanging around everywhere, and that stuff just looks messy. It looks cluttered. It doesn't look like you took the time to actually set this up nicely. That kills the level of professionalism. That kills some of the cinematic or the quality feel of the video that you're putting out. And the time of day is also very important when you're choosing a location and what you're going to shoot. The best times of day for me, I like to shoot early in the morning, or in the evening to later at night. Early in the morning and the evening because the light is usually the softest. The sun hasn't come all the way up, the light isn't harsh yet, the colors are usually really, really nice. And in the evening, you get that nice sunset, you've got golden hour right after sunset where that residual light is still kind of illuminating the sky. You're not gonna have any shadows, but the colors you're gonna get are gonna pop significantly better than you would if you were shooting at 12 o'clock or 1 p.m. on a really sunny day. Okay, so to wrap it up, all right, so when we're talking about camera position and movement, we want to add variety. Uh, we want to add different camera angles because if we keep the camera in the same spot the entire time, uh, people, uh, visual interest, uh, we are, we've got a very short attention span these days, and so you might be losing people's attention. So whatever that is, if it's an interview, um, a little bit more advanced tip is we use two cameras, so that way we can swap between the two cameras. But even reframing, uh, making the image larger can also add that, but adding some B-roll or some action video that goes over top of your interview video can help do that. 
you uh, use unique camera location. So in one of the video examples, uh, we were able to put the camera right down on the ground and get a unique uh, angle there. Uh, we see the world uh, as humans in basically from six feet down to four feet. Some are a little bit lower, some might be a little bit taller, but we see the world at that angle. And so if we always keep the camera at that range, it isn't as visually interesting. The nice part about uh, camera phones and smaller GoPros and stuff like that is we can put them in unique locations. It's not a big camera that we have to keep up on a tripod at eye location. That's going to add visual interest and can help you in the storytelling aspect of what you're trying to do. And then also uh, try to reduce shaky video. Um, the tw there's tools out there such as the gimbals and just now cameras having um, image stabilization, but just practicing good technique of holding the camera solid or putting it on a tripod, tripod can help reduce that shaky video, which by default is going to make your video look very amateurish or not have that professional look. Uh, golden hour, you, you heard it mentioned there, that's the, the period shortly after sunrise or before sunset in which daylight is softer and more visually appealing. That's, uh, you'll hear it from any videographer, that's kind of the, the ideal photographer, same thing is the ideal time to film uh, because that light isn't as harsh, that's something we really look for. Uh, it's, got, it's how your commercial shoots, the, the stuff you see on TV, why it looks so good is either they've lit it with the thousands of dollars of professional lights or they're using one of the cheapest and most abundant light sources, which is the sun, at the right time. So here's a video that will talk you through why golden hour and what it is and why it's so important, kind of iterating on that last video. Golden hour is the time of the day around sunrise and sunset, and the sun is closest to the horizon, creating soft, even light. Shooting during this time can result in amazing footage, but it does come with its own set of challenges. That's why timing it right and using the proper camera settings can lead to eye-popping visuals that help you stand out from the pack. Here are five tips for shooting during golden hour. First of all, golden hour isn't always a true hour. Technically speaking, golden hour is the time just after sunrise and just before sunset when the sun is at its most golden. Secondly, depending on the time of year, your altitude and your latitude, your golden hour's duration can vary wildly. There are several websites that display golden hour information, and there are even a few golden hour smartphone apps that you can use to get the exact duration for any location, elevation, and date. The only way to know what your location looks like during golden hour is to actually witness it beforehand. Go out and scout both sunrise and sunset to see which looks best. Keep an eye on the sun's path in the sky and look for any shadows it creates as it rises and sets. Take your camera and look at your settings. That way, you won't waste any time figuring out your exposure when you could be shooting. If you can't reach your destination before you shoot, you can check digital tools like Google Earth that actually show you the sun's trajectory and lighting during a given time of day. Blue hour is the time just before the sun rises or just after the sun sets, when there is still enough even, soft light to give you additional great-looking footage. With blue hour light, the sky is a deeper blue and has more saturated colors, which can lead to a more dramatic and melancholy feel. It can be difficult to match golden hour and blue hour shots, so work separately within each time period as much as possible. Your exposure and color temperature are going to dramatically change as the sun starts to rise or set in the sky, so constantly monitor your settings to keep it consistent. For color temperature, Auto white balance will usually work well, but the shade or cloudy presets can also give you positive results. Manual white balance gives you the most control, but you'll need to keep a watchful eye and make adjustments often as the light changes. As far as your ISO, know what your camera's native ISO is, because once you start going above that, your image can start to lose quality and have camera noise or grain. Lastly, opening or closing your aperture to keep exposure can drastically change your depth of field, so if you have a specific look you want to keep, work with other exposure settings instead. The majority of your shots are going to be pointing the camera toward the sun or away from the sun, using it to light your subject. Try to experiment as well by using the sun in more creative ways, like as a rim light behind your subject, or trying to use the sun to create a nice lens flare. You can direct the sun's light with reflectors or bounce cards, or the sun can even be bounced off a body of water. No matter what you do, shooting during magic hour is incredibly beautiful and rewarding when you do it right. 
and you'll learn loads about using natural light in your productions along the way. As a bonus, you'll also learn how to shoot quickly within a tight window. If you liked this video, subscribe to us on YouTube for more tutorials. You can also read the con. So that video is from Pond5, uh, puts out some really good content there. They're a uh, stock video uh, provider that we've used some footage from them and licensed when we weren't, uh, wasn't feasible for us to capture that. Uh, well, one recommendation I can say on the production side is to script and plan ahead. Um, that's a key thing. That's one of the things that we do, especially with a lot of uh, talking head videos. If we're in front of the camera, we uh, oftentimes it's easier to script that and plan that ahead than to be candid and just try to nail it by talking and uh, winging it. So here's a video uh, example of how we can script and plan ahead. Hi, I'm Danny, the assistant video producer at Molly Marketing, and today I want to share with you a tool we recommend for recording videos just like this one. To keep your videos on topic and to the point, you can use a teleprompter like this. It makes remembering your script a lot easier. The video on the far left is a screen recording showing you what this app looks like on your phone. The video in the center is a third person perspective of someone utilizing this app. And then finally, our video on the right is the camera facing our subject recording this video. So yeah, so that's an example of using a teleprompter app. That app specifically was called Big, Big Boo. Big View? <laughs> Big View. Um, that's one that we found that's pretty good there. It's got a free option that has a watermark down in your exported video, but they also have a paid option where you get the full capabilities. Uh, we use uh, a teleprompter app that we just recently used on a project with Callie filming the governor there uh, at his uh, office there, and so we're able to put that message on screen. Uh, when we do talking head videos where we're in front of the camera, we like to script them just to keep it on point and as concise as possible. Uh, and that teleprompter app, that runs on an iPad that sits in front of the camera with a mirror. Um, the other one runs directly in the camera. Uh, but live video, that's another thing that within the last couple of years, the capabilities um, and the technology has just made leaps and bounds about what we're able to do, whereas five, ten years ago, pretty much uh, TV stations were really the only ones that could do live video at this scale. A uh, thing to keep in mind um, with the different um, ones, Facebook allows you to stream live, YouTube now allows you to stream live, uh, with uh, Instagram you've got your semi-live stories that you're adding to, as well as with Snapchat you've got your semi-live stories. Uh, but our recommendations for live video is to promote your broadcast beforehand. So uh, very similar to this webinar, um, Callie and the folks at the Nebraska Tourism Commission had sent out emails about this, letting you know beforehand, promoting that, sending an email link to that. Um, you also want to prepare and practice, so obviously I needed to prepare and practice for this before I was going to give this presentation and not just wing it. Uh, but you also want to be personable. Um, key thing is putting people on camera that are actually nice, genuine people that come off in that manner. I've seen too many videos, especially on the live video side, where it's easy and accessible. Well, just because it's easy and accessible doesn't mean every single person should be on camera giving that live video. You also want to offer context constantly. Um, so you're going to have people, especially in a live video, that they might come in halfway through the presentation. And so if you're periodically, you know, wrapping up and kind of uh, contextualizing what you're talking about, that's going to help the people that might have hopped in midstream in the middle of it and missed out on that at the beginning. You also want to be responsive to comments and feedback. If you've got a second person that can monitor the comments and feedbacks and respond in real time or tell you those on camera so that way, one of the things I don't like are the people that will do a live stream and then sit there and respond and take 10 minutes just responding to the comments in real time and it's like, wow, all right, we're 10 minutes already into this and they're just now getting to the content. So you want to be conscious of that and keep, uh, keep that as efficient as possible. Ultimately, when we're talking about uh, shooting video, our best tip is just start recording. Uh, as you record videos, especially internally, the more you do, the better you're going to get. Don't be intimidated by quality. Um, the nice part about it is people are consuming more content, more video, more photos than we've ever been before. Unfortunately, most all of us are fairly addicted to our smartphones. We're on them a lot, and so what you're going to see is there's a wide gamut of the type of quality that's out there. Um, there's a place for all quality levels. You know, if you're a small business, people aren't expecting you to spend 10, 15, 20, 30 thousand dollars on a video project because if you do, they're probably wondering, you're probably missing out in some other key areas. You don't have to be on that Nike, that Apple level of quality. Those 
those companies have millions of dollars to spend. Um, aim to get better with each video that you do. You're just gonna you're gonna learn. You're gonna get more experience. You're gonna realize some things work better than others. It's the same thing for me. Every single video project, I'm learning something, <laughs> and we're using that constantly to refine our process and to get better. Uh, I want to talk next. We're gonna talk about post production. Um, this is the editing. This is bringing together those assets. Um, live video is a little bit different, where you've kind of already got the video finished there. Uh, but anything that's non-live video, we're gonna have some form of editing. The nice part about it is you can have and your camera and your editing uh, software and uh, platform be the same with smartphone apps, tablet apps. Uh, computer apps and then web apps. There's a number of different ways now, more than there ever has before. It's kind of a theme that's been going on here with technology on ways that you can edit a uh, video. Uh, mobile editing apps, kind of the recommendations that we have are iMovie. If you've got an iOS device, comes free now, I believe, with all iOS devices. So your iPhone, your tablet can access iMovie. Uh, GoPro Splice, that's put out by GoPro, but you don't have to own a GoPro to use it. Um, it's something they realize, you know, people are capturing a lot of video, usually like an hour of them skiing down the hill. Well, no one wants to see an hour of you skiing down a hill. They want to see that 20 seconds of you skiing down the hill and maybe your crash at the end. So they want to give you the capabilities um, to edit that footage down and make it more appealing. Uh, Filmora Go is another one that we've had uh, people that we've worked with have used and recommended. And then LumaFusion was the app that I used to edit all the videos at the beginning where you saw Danny, who works with Molly Marketing, on camera. So we did the editing of that completely within the iPad. So we shot the videos on an iPhone and then used AirDrop to send them over to the iPad. And then uh, that's a paid app, uh, $30, but it is the most full-fledged editing app that I've seen out there. It's very close to what we have on the desktop side and utilize. So computer editing apps, uh, if you have an Apple computer, it comes with iMovie. Uh, has a lot of capabilities. Uh, if you want to take a step up there on the Apple side of it, Final Cut Pro is a good option. It's uh, $300, so a little bit of an expense. Uh, Adobe Premiere is the platform that we use because we're working on uh, PCs and Apple devices. It's a uh, device agnostic and so we're able to work on both of those. It actually has a pretty low cost entry point because it's a monthly subscription. So if you've already got someone on your team that has a design software, they most likely have access to Adobe Premiere. There's also online editing apps. So YouTube has a video editor um, that you can utilize that's free. Um, Animoto is a paid option that can help with uh, slideshows and animations. Um, and then there's other programs like Adobe Spark videos that are free options um, that give you some capability, especially on the mobile side. And then also uh, another mobile one that I didn't mention was Adobe has come out with a version, a trimmed down version of Premiere that's called Adobe Rush that's on smartphones. Uh, another one that we found just recently um, that we really like is it's an app called Spark Video. Um, and it kind of takes the idea of shooting and editing and combining them together at the same time. Um, so if you're familiar with like Snapchat and other apps like that where you just hold down and it records, then you let off and it stops recording, then you hold down. Well, this uses that same philosophy, but then allows you to edit the clip. So you can rearrange the time. You get a lot of that capabilities, but it's super easy to use. It's on a smartphone. Um, and and so we've been utilizing that for some quick turnaround videos or some internal videos, and that's one that I recommend. It has a free version as well as a paid version, um, and it's just a really good app to try out and utilize and get that start in video, especially if you dread taking all those files back and having to edit them. You can do it all while you're on, out in the field or wherever it is that you're recording. Uh, one key thing that we recommend in the editing process to, is to keep your videos short. Know your audience, know the distribution channel that you're utilizing. Uh, if it's, for, like I said earlier, for a website, it can be a little bit longer. If it's YouTube, uh, it can be a little bit longer as long as it's kind of that educa educational or informative content. People are willing to uh, utilize that. Uh, it's basically a search engine. But if it's for social media, if it's for Facebook, if it's for Instagram, you really want to keep those 60 seconds or less. Um, video voiceover. So as you notice with pretty much all the videos that I had, there was my voice um, and it wasn't me talking here. So I recorded those after we shot the video um, because I knew in a lot of those instances I didn't want to have to be on camera talking because I didn't think I'd be able to keep it short and concise. So we shot the video, edited it into a timeline, and then I actually just uh, plugged a microphone into the iPad, um, that same lavalier microphone. And normally I would script those out, but I didn't really have time to script those out. So I would just read them as I played the video in the background 
one, recorded that, allowed me the flexibility to kind of move it around. If I made a mistake, I could restart or I could edit at that point. But that allows you to be more concise and not have to cover every bullet point on camera when you're out there and you've got a million things going through your mind. Um, it also gives you the capabilities of being in a controlled environment. So when you're out somewhere filming, audio isn't always the greatest, and so you can record that later at a place, a great place for recording audio without having to go to an audio recording studio is a closet. A closet is gonna have all your clothes in there. It's usually in the center of a home, and so um, you don't have a ton of background noise, and those clothes help cut down on reverb and echo. Uh, for music resources, uh, I'm gonna I've got a couple up here that I'll kind of mention. Uh, we've in the past used premiumbeat.com. That's a pay per song um, model. So each song that you need, if you only needed one or two, that might be a great uh, route to go. We uh, actually utilize the next two, which is Artlist and Soundstripe. Those are annual subscriptions, and they're nice. You pay a one-time fee for the year, but then you get unlimited um, uses of songs on there. So we're using five to ten songs a month on videos, so those definitely make sense for us. Uh, YouTube also has an audio library that you can go in and utilize for free. Um, they've got quite a few good tracks. There's other um, resources out there such as Free Music Archive that allows you to utilize free music. Um, one key thing is we don't just take songs off the radio, download them, put them into our videos because especially if we're selling something, we don't actually, we might have bought the song um, to play in an MP3 player, to play on our computer, but we haven't bought the rights for broadcast or for internet. So you want to shy away from using those. Um, one of the reasons there, like I said, if you're selling a product, you could be liable uh, for the copyright use of that. And then also um, it might get flagged by one of the social medias that you upload to it. Um, YouTube has been pretty good about, it'll just uh, recognize that it's someone else's content and then um, you won't be able to collect ad revenue and it'll actually give ad revenue to the content creator. Facebook, a lot of times will just flag it and just let you know, hey, this video, isn't going to get posted because you're using copyrighted content. All right, distribution. Um, unfortunately, the old adage that if you build it, they will come does not work with distribution. You've got to actually think through and have a strategy and uh, just uploading your video to YouTube um, that someone might have got away with a couple years ago, that's not a distribution strategy. That can be a part of the distribution strategy, but that's only one component. So what we recommend for a distribution strategy is to embed the video on your website if it makes sense. Um, a lot of times people are coming to your website um, and if you don't have the videos there, that's the first place someone's going to check. Then they might bounce over to your YouTube page, but if they know of you and have seen maybe a snippet of the video, but they want to go watch it again, make sure to have a place on your um, website where all of your videos are at. Uh, you can email the video link to followers and leads that can take them to your website. Um, it's a great place uh, or the landing page specifically for that. Uh, you can also upload it, the video to your YouTube channel. Um, like I said, that's kind of the second place I go to when I'm researching videos and know of a brand that I saw one that I really wanted to see again. Uh, you can also upload the video to your Facebook page. There you can consider a uh, paid boost of that post to help jump start the organic audience that you uh, will reach with that. Same thing on Instagram. Um, Facebook and Instagram are dialed in really well together since uh, Instagram is owned by Facebook. So that's just one process of where you can just click, hey, I'm sending it to, over to Instagram as well. Um, Twitter has a built-in video player as well. If you utilize Twitter, that could be an option. Um, and LinkedIn just recently added a built-in video player as well. It had in the past just utilized YouTube. So all of those give you paid boost option. Um, another one is Pinterest, if that makes sense with your target market. Um, that can be beneficial as well. So what does this look like in theory or in action? Um, I worked at a, a regional bank for six years and this was an example. So this was an employee spotlight that we video that we did for each new employee that came in. So we had our video there, but just because we produced video doesn't mean anybody's gonna see it. So the first thing we put it on our website, we had a news and stories um, blog on our website that was <clears throat> constantly updated with new articles and everything. So we've got the video embedded there. We've got an associated written little blog post with that. Um, we also uploaded it to the uh, bank's Facebook channel, YouTube channel, and then we also, in the um, weekly or monthly email newsletter that went out there, we'd have that short little blurb about it and a link back over to the website. So we've got all these uh, forms of distribution channels funneling all towards that one piece of content. 
So when you talk about embedding videos on your website, um, YouTube is the best free option, in my opinion. Um, it gives you a lot of capabilities. The nice part about YouTube is they spent millions and millions of dollars making sure their videos play on just about every device, from TVs, tablets, smartphones, um, everything there. And so utilizing that can ensure that your video is going to play correctly. Um, Wistia and Vimeo are other good paid options that are going to give you a little bit more control than what YouTube does. Um, with YouTube you might have seen where it shows the related videos. Um, there's a little snippet of code that you can make it make sure it only displays your related videos and not just random other ones but that related videos feature isn't hard coded in there and it's not something you can take off whereas with Wistia and Vimeo you can take that off they give you additional capabilities as far as gating a video so you could have your regular introduction 15 seconds of starting the video and then you could actually have an email form that drops down over the screen and requires them to in input an email address and capture that lead in order to watch the rest of the video and that's all directly in the in the video player it's not an extra link that they have to go click over and get a link it just really simplifies that but again those are paid options so it depends on the budget that you have so yeah I went through that pretty quick um, Callie by chance do we have any questions that came up yeah, I do have several questions here. I've been organizing them for you. Oh, awesome. Um, it's been a really popular session, but um, let me go ahead and start off here. The first question actually comes out from Kimball, and they've asked, what audiences are most responsive to digital and video marketing? <laughs> What audiences? Well, I mean, really, it's it's an easy thing. What I what I always recommend is kind of think through who your audience is, and then talk to people that are actually in that audience. So if we're creating content for a client that targets, like I said, 18 to 25 year olds, we might go grab and do a little bit of focus testing with a couple of 18 to 20 year olds. Ask them, hey, what apps are you using? What, wh how do you use your smartphone? Are you watching videos on Facebook? Learn a little bit about that audience or just do a little bit of research. There's a number of different companies out there that provide statistics and uh, overall generational information there. But my biggest thing is I talk to the people that are in that target market and ask them because they may see it completely different. We might think, hey, Facebook is a great way of reaching these uh, younger generations, but now they're not spending much time on there because their parents and their grandparents are on there. And so it might be, hey, they're using Instagram a lot and that's got a great tie-in with Facebook. Let's utilize that. Awesome. And this is just a follow-up question. This comes from Grand Island. Um, how do I gauge the successful results of digital media marketing? Digital media marketing, um, again, that's something that we don't look at vanity metrics. So vanity metrics are your views, your likes. Uh, those are nice ways to gauge popularity of content, but ultimately it comes down to having a specific goal tied to that specific type of content. So like I said, uh, we're not creating a video to get views. We're not trying to make the next viral video because that's not exactly a science and is very difficult to do. What we want is a specific action that people are going to take. So whether that's if it's a travel and tourism destination, one of the key things that with a lot of travel and tour tourism destinations is get people to get your guide. Whether that's the printed version or a downloaded version, you know, that might be what our, our uh, video is specifically geared towards. And so the version that's on Facebook may just be pointing them towards the website to get more information because, hey, that might, might we might be catching someone that isn't even familiar with our destination, but we want to kind of prick their interest. Whereas the video on our website, someone's actively come there, they've shown interest in there, that could be a little bit more in depth and that one could actually have the, the hard sell of downloading that guide. So it's, it's really about a Establishing, you know, what is that specific goal that we want this video to, to do? We can have secondary goals, but really that's what's going to measure the success of it. And that's ultimately how we're going to gauge, hey, was this a success? Did we have 60 people download our guide or get our guide sent to them? That's how we're going to measure it. Not necessarily, hey, we had 600 views. Well, great. What did 600 views do for us, though? Mm -hmm. Great. And um, the next question I have comes from Ord, Nebraska and they're looking for advice so they sent me um, how do i approach digital media marketing if i don't have a strong digital presence so mostly i'm involved in traditional marketing solutions can you tell me what to do to start 
<laughs> well, you know, um, on that, my recommendation would be to to start small. Um, you, uh, I imagine they probably have a website, so there's your first step into that. Is that website optimized for social or? not social, but for mobile. Um, key things there is just making sure it's uh, accessible from a smartphone, and then kind of testing the waters with social media. Um, that's a great way to get out there um, for free. Um, obviously, the more you utilize it, the bigger you become. Um, Facebook is a business. They have um, shareholders, and so some of that requires you to pay, uh, but it doesn't have to be. You're not signing a $10,000 budget. I've boosted $5 posts for people just to kind of give it a little bit of a jump start, and then they start sharing sharing, liking, getting a little bit of traction, and then there's that organic growth that can come from that. Um, but another recommendation I'd say is maybe reach out to some local resources if there's someone some, a lot of times it could, typically can be younger people um, that have a good grasp with that. Just sit down and talk with them, find out if there's anyone in your community that offers that service or can at least provide some training. There's a ton and ton of webinars online. Um, that's kind of the thing that I, a big recommendation of mine, <laughs> about 80% of what I learned, what I do on a daily basis when it comes to video production was self-taught and it was self-taught by going online videos, um, webinars, um, different courses that you can take online. So as long as you've got an internet access, um, doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can get information. So those are my biggest recommendations. Wonderful. Um, this question comes out from Scott's Bluff, and they sent in, a common misconception is that digital marketing will not reach an older, more traditional audience, like that of many businesses in rural Nebraska. And how do you respond to that? Yeah. Um, Big response to that is the, the most, a lot of times the most active um, generations on Facebook especially are your older generations. Um, they've now come around to it and you're going to see your younger generations move away from that because like I said their, their parents, their grandparents are on there. Um, I think it really a big thing is come with smartphone um, usage. Pretty much everyone now has a smartphone, even your older generations as much as they may not like it. Um, and curse at it, um, they have a device there, and that's really been a way um, for digital to really reach as many people as possible. Uh, if it came to your computer, yeah, that you don't necessarily have to use your computer, you can get by without using that, but a, a phone pretty much is a necessity, unfortunately, these days, and most people now um, have smartphones and now are utilizing those. They, they want to see what their grandkids are doing, they want to see what their family is doing, and that's where Facebook comes in there. Um, obviously, it's got its downsides to it as well, but it is a power Powerful platform for reaching a lot of people. Wonderful. And then this is the last question I have for you. Um, and it actually comes from South Sioux City. And they ask, how can digital marketing help me develop a brand personality? I would say digital marketing is very helpful because it allows you to control the message, um, create the message. Um, a brand, um, it's a little bit tough because a brand, uh, a definition of a brand is actually what other people feel, think, and about your brand. So you don't have control over that, but you have um, the ability to influence, the ability to portray yourself in a certain way. Um, it also, great ways it allows you to have voice. Um, a lot of companies don't have much voice or are viewed as being very um, unfriendly or maybe not the most friendly. Um, using digital marketing, using social media, using video marketing allows you to show the people behind your business. Every business at the end of the day has people behind it. Uh, if you're travel, if you're attracting a lot of people online, that can be tough because there's a screen in front of them. Well, put a person on camera. Put a person there that's going to resonate and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation or a one-on-many conversation but feels natural, allows them to have that voice, explain the people behind it. That's a big recommendation. One of the things we're doing internally is putting uh, out a series on our employees. You know, not everyone gets to meet all of our employees. They don't get to know the things that make us who we are. And with design and with video marketing, that's a lot of what influences what we do. And so we're going to put our employees on camera, release videos, spotlighting each of them. It's a very easy way to tap into the networks of our employees, but also show that they are valued and provide that voice behind the company. Yeah. Danny did a great job in the videos. <laughs> so yeah. thank you. Shout out to Danny. Um, but Jamie and I really appreciate you coming in. Thank you for everyone who's tuned in. And um, I hope you got some great content from here. If I missed any questions, you can also contact Jamie directly. 
His uh, email information is included in this webinar, so if you want to look back through that, be certain to grab that, and I'm sure he'll be happy to connect with you. Um, additionally, please remember to take the survey today. Give us any feedback. Um, tell us your thoughts, and hope to see you next month.